Good morning, community. How are you feeling this morning? Welcome to Caffeination Sunday. So good to be with you. Now is probably a good time to remind you that we have a cafe, and today only they're serving uh, coffee in bucket size. So uh, <laughs> take advantage of that. Uh, how many of you here love taking like personality profile tests? Anyone love taking personality tests? I took one this week and I found out that I don't have one. So that's unfortunate. Uh, pray for me. <laughs> But as Patrick mentioned a little bit later in the service, we're all gonna have a chance to discover our generosity profile. And uh, if you weren't with us last week, kind of the general thesis from last week was that we believe that all of us are wired for generosity. We went to the very beginning of the story, Genesis 1. We saw that God created every single one of us in his image and likeness. And so that means that because we believe that God is love, we're wired for love. We believe that God is eternal, which means that we're wired for eternity. And because we believe that God is generous, we believe that every single one of us is wired, it's hardwired in our DNA to be generous. In fact, we see in John 3, 16, maybe the most famous verse of all time, that God so loved the world that he what? He, he gave. God's love drove him to generosity. Generosity was an impulse of his love and he's wired each of us to live in that same type of way. And we talked about, there's a couple of different places in scripture we think it's really clear uh, that God's generosity is present and moving. In those two places, last week we talked about one being in creation, that when we see a beautiful sunset or we experience a steak burrito, we know that there is a God and that he loves us. That in creation, that every moment that we're alive, every breath that we take is a reminder that this all is a gift that we're to be stewards of what God has freely given to us that we could never earn or deserve on our own. And the second place that we saw God's generosity was at the cross. That Jesus, through his life, death, and his resurrection, made peace with us and God and us and others. That, that he changed the game and that we see at the very center of the character of God is a God who is generous, who doesn't white knuckle who he is and what he has, but gives freely. And so that if we're image bearers, we believe that we're called, in fact, we're even invited to live that kind of way, to live with a constant awareness of God's presence in and around us and to walk in generosity. So what does that actually look like to do that, to walk in generosity? To do that, I wanna, uh, I'm gonna head to 2 Corinthians 9, and uh, if you wanna turn there now, you can. If you don't have a Bible with you, um, that's okay, Jesus still loves you. Uh, Second Corinthians nine, if you wanna turn there, we'll have it on the screen as well. But to, to give a little context, in Second Corinthians eight, Paul is writing to uh, the church in Corinth, they're gathering of Christ followers, who had made a commitment to send an offering to the impoverished Christ followers in Jerusalem, but they, they actually hadn't followed through on that yet. So Paul is, is sort of trying to, to navigate what could be a potentially awkward conversation. Here's what he says in 2 Corinthians 9. He says, remember this. And I love that he starts that way because he's not telling them something new. Remember, these are people who have experienced the life-changing grace of God. He says, let me, let me just remind you of how this thing all works. He says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So he has sort of two categories here, right? He says those who sow sparingly and those who sow generously. And I, I found it really fascinating that he doesn't offer a third category of those who don't sow at all. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say sparingly, generously, and those who don't at all. And I think the reason for that is this, that every single one of us is sowing something. In some way, we're giving of ourselves to someone or something, even if we're not aware of it. Every single one of us is pouring ourselves out. Our time, our talents, our resources are going somewhere. Some of us are doing it sparingly. Some of us are doing it generously. But for Paul, not sowing isn't an option. We all are always, to some degree, in some capacity, pouring ourselves out, we're sowing something. Now note what Paul says here, he says, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. Now, why, why would he include that? The reason for that, I think, is Paul's saying, man, this isn't about 
guilt or compulsion. It's, it's not about someone sending a letter or someone standing on a stage saying, I mean, you really should be giving. He says, no, decide in your heart what you're gonna give. Why, why does he say that? I think it's because motivation matters. Motivation matters. For, for example, um, I would love to be ripped, okay? <laughs> why are you laughing? That's... <laughs> I would love to be ripped. However, I also love bacon. Anyone with me? <laughs> right, preach, amen. Uh, ultimately, when it comes down to between who, what I'm motivated more toward, either working out or bacon, um, which do you think wins out most? Bacon, there's a reason I'm wearing a sweater right now. That's exactly why. Bacon often wins, and my, my motivation is often trumped, whether it's running at 6 a.m. or having a plate full of delicious bacon, often bacon wins. And Paul is saying, man, decide in your heart. Don't, don't be guilted into this. Don't, don't let it be a compulsion thing. Decide the kind of generous person that you want to be. When we're motivated to give, we give cheerfully, Right? Like think about like a, like a gift you were really excited to give someone. Maybe, maybe you don't have a good history of giving gifts and you saw something and it was six months before this person's birthday and you got it anyway because you're like, man, this is the gift. This is the gift of all gifts. Like when you, when you gave it to them and they started tearing the paper away, you probably weren't thinking like, man, I wonder if I could have gotten a cheaper one used on Amazon. No, because you, man, you know that this, this is the gift to end all gifts and you're watching them open it and you give cheerfully because your motivation is this relation, this person that you know and care for. When our motivation is right, we can give cheerfully. There's a, a 14th century theologian named Julian of Norwich, and she put it this way. Uh, Cheerful givers do not count the cost of what they give. Their hearts are set on pleasing and cheering the person to whom the gift is given. So please hear that. When we talk about generosity, what we're first talking about is closeness with Jesus, about having our hearts more aligned with what he's doing in the world and to see all that we have as a gift from him. We're all hardwired to be generous people because the God who made us is a generous God. It's deeply embedded in our DNA. But the thing is, we're all motivated by different things. It's probably not mind-blowing to most of you here, but we're all motivated by very different things. So we thought if, if we could better understand what drives and motivates us, maybe we actually could help each other grow in these different areas. Well, there's a, a community attender actually who's this brilliant business consultant. In fact, he, he's contributed to the Harvard Business Review and a bunch of other places. His, his, his job is to help companies understand what drives and motivates their clients. That's his expertise. And so last fall, we surveyed like hundreds of community staff and attenders, and these six generosity profiles kind of bubbled to the top. So we surveyed hundreds of people, asked them all kinds of crazy questions, and these six profiles kind of bubbled to the top. So after analyzing all this data, uh, this attender determined that we could narrow it down to a eight question survey and with 70% accuracy, we could figure out which of those profiles we kind of best align with. So as Patrick mentioned, we actually wanna take a little bit of time right here and now to take this survey. So if you have your smartphones, go ahead and pull them out. Um, if you downloaded the app, you can open up the app and uh, the quiz will be right there. If you'd rather just go to the website, you can do that now. If you've had the app for a while, you might need to refresh the app and that icon will show up in the top left there. But we're actually gonna give you like a minute, minute and a half to actually take this test right here and now. It's eight questions, I, I promise you can do it. And, um, and we're actually gonna carve out some time to do that together. Now, if you're here today and uh, you don't have a smartphone, first off, uh, we're praying for you. What's going on? <laughs> Second, though, I'm gonna unpack uh, these six profiles a little bit, and my guess is you'll hear one and say, yeah, okay, I'm, that's, that's probably where I'm most aligned. That makes most sense to me. And before we take this test, let me just say, we're all like complex humans made up of probably all six of these in some capacity. We're, we're not saying you're only this or you're only driven by that, but this will help us better understand what kind of drives and motivates us. So I'm gonna give you about a minute. Go ahead and answer those eight questions. When you are done, would you just hold your phone up over your head and just keep it there so I can kind of get a sense of who's taking it? It'll be like a Bon Jovi concert. It'll be a blast. Okay, so go ahead, get out your phones, take that quiz, and then hold it up when you're ready and keep it there.
Yeah, you can, you can wave them if you want, if that would help you. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Put them up and you're done. Keep it up. Keep it up so I can tell. <laughs> it's starting to feel real cool in here. <laughs> now, some of y'all have enormous phones. That's crazy. <laughs> All right, hold that up when you're ready. Hold it up and keep it up. Wave it around like you just don't care. Great. Keep it up, keep it up. Okay, 30 seconds. All right, go ahead and raise the roof with your phone a little bit. Just raise it. Says the guy in a cardigan. All right, 20 seconds. You guys have no idea how cool it feels up here right now. <laughs> All right, 10 seconds, put that phone up when you're done. Okay, wow, right on. That's felt about 10 seconds, right? I'm not really keeping track at all. Okay. All right, so go ahead and put your phones down and we're gonna, we're gonna unpack these six profiles and remember, we're not all just motivated by one thing, okay? So, so keep that in mind. All right, so uh, we're gonna start first with the cause movers. If you're a cause mover, let me hear a what, what? All right, right on. A good amount of cause movers. You're motivated by making a difference. A lot of you, maybe you, you have like a, an activist mindset, like let's make something happen. You're drawn to causes in the here and now. You're often the first person to step up to meet a tangible need. You're relational and you're responsive. Relational and responsive. And I think you like seeing your giving make an, uh, make an observable difference. For you, like it kind of gets your, your heart pumping when you actually see like, oh man, that made a difference in this, in this life, in this community, in this story, whatever it is. You like seeing that your generosity is making a tangible, observable difference. I think a good example of a cause mover in the Bible is a, a parable that many of us know. It's from, uh, it's from the Gospel of Luke. It's called the Good Samaritan. And essentially the story, I was traveling. Uh, he gets beat up pretty, pretty bad. I can relate. And uh, he's sort of left for dead. And uh, two religious people will kind of pass over on the other side of the road, kind of leave him be. And the person who stops to save him is a Samaritan. And uh, the Samaritan doesn't just stop to bandage his wounds. He puts him on his donkey, actually brings him to an inn, and even pays the innkeeper to continue caring for this person. Cause movers are moved by compassion. Oh, there's, there's a need here. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, an opportunity here, and you're often among the first to sort of say, I'll be a part of that. I'll make something happen to make an impact. Uh, the second are the budget keepers. But budget keepers, um, if, if you're a budget keeper, you just say, present. present. <laughs> That's the most enthusiastic I've ever heard someone say present. That was incredible. Now, now you, you non-BKs might be thinking like, this one doesn't seem very exciting. But quick show of hands, how, how many of you like get a rush from crunching numbers? Anyone? Like you love, yeah, spreadsheets and you, <laughs> you, you like thank God for you. In fact, if any of you want to come to my house and help me out, I, we're still stuffing it under the mattress. Um, but budget keepers have a high sense of responsibility. They, they want to manage their resources wisely. They enjoy budgeting and they ask questions like, what can I afford to give? And likely for you BKs, you budget keepers, once you decide what that is, you stick to it. Now, if there are like unforeseen expenses, like a car breaks down or something, you, you might like ratchet back your generosity a little bit, but once things are more predictable, you'll likely get back on track. The other thing about budget keepers is you all tend to be pretty comfortable talking about money. Is that true? Like where a lot of people get kind of squeamish talking about money, budget keepers are like, nope, that's fine. I understand that this makes a difference. It's important to talk about it. In fact, it's, if we don't talk about it, that's not a good thing. You're comfortable talking about money and your primary motivation is being wise. To be wise with what God has given you. Now, I think the woman described in Proverbs 31 is a great example of a budget keeper. Now, we don't know her name. We don't know a whole lot of her context, but she's, she's described as a woman of noble character who is wise with how she manages her resources. Budget keepers are motivated by how, how can I be a good steward of what's been entrusted to me? You're motivated by being wise 
with those resources. Okay, number three. Number three are the faith stretchers. If you're a faith stretcher, go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm making these up on the spot, so that's, I appreciate you playing along. Faith stretchers. Now, I, I think of faith stretchers, uh, I think of a story from Luke 21. Now, the, the scene here uh, is, a, is a bit unique. Jesus is standing uh, in some sort of establishment, some sort of faith establishment, some sort of synagogue, and he's watching people um, bring their offerings. So they're, I mean, imagine what that must have been like, first off, right? People, everyone comes forward to, to like bring their offerings, and Jesus is sort of just standing watching. I'm like, is that it, bro? Is that, you know that I know how much you make, right? Like this is, so it's a lot of like the big wigs, and to be totally honest, there's, there's a lot of big cash, there's a lot of people that like made that a bit of a show and they're bringing all this, all this money and then there's this poor widow who has the equivalent of like two pennies and that's it. That's like all she has. And she gives these two pennies and Jesus praises her for this incredible act of faith. Faith stretchers are motivated by spiritual growth. By spiritual growth. You often see generosity as a part of your faith journey. In fact, you're more inclined to stretch yourself because you know that God is faithful. And not just like in your brain, but like in your heart, and your gut. You're like, I know that God is faithful, therefore uh, we, we can stretch a bit here. We can, we can give a little more of our time, talent, and treasure there. Like for you, it's, it's about stretching and growing your faith because you, you know that you're gonna grow in your faith. That's incentive enough for you. Uh, fourth profile are the disciplined doers. Disciplined doers. If you're a disciplined doer, let's hear... Um, Aye, aye, Captain. Sure. <laughs> or laughter, I like that too. <laughs> Discipline doers, you want to do things right. For you, it's about doing things right. You find joy in being obedient to God. In fact, you find the commands in Scripture to not only be clear, but to be kind of life-giving. Like, man, that, if, that's, if that's how God said we're to live, then that's how we're going to live. Your motivation is joyful obedience. Joyful obedience. In fact, tell me if this is true for you. Like, you find that the more obedient that you are, the more aligned you feel with God and what he's doing in the world. That when, that when you are, you're disciplined in doing what you know to be the right thing, like, man, over time, that just creates, like, an alignment. Like, man, I just feel like I'm, like I'm tracking with God. I'm tracking with my spouse. I'm tracking with my family and my church community, my small group. Like, when you are disciplined, there's something in your heart. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That just, that just, that feels right, I think a good role model for a disciplined doer uh, would be in Luke 19, that's Zacchaeus. Not pre-Jesus Zacchaeus, that guy was awful. Um, but post-Jesus Zacchaeus, man, his, his whole life gets turned upside down when Jesus actually goes to his house. In fact, out of, out of this joyful obedience, um, he not only pays back all of his debts, but he goes way above and beyond. You can like just sense, like once he realizes that God loves him just as he is. God delights in him, not a better version of him. Once he's experienced grace, he says, wait, what, what can I do to be more gentle? Like, well, how, how can I respond in light of this revelation? And so he goes and pays back his debts and not only equal, but way above and beyond. He took great joy in doing the right thing. Fifth profile are the community growers. Community growers. Uh, if you're a community grower, just hug a person near you right now. You just love, yeah, go and just, just hug them. That, was, that, one, that one was weird, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you are motivated by being a part of a community. You're motivated by being a part of a community. You love when like, people come together to make something happen. This is probably the one that I'm most aligned with, man. When people come together to make an impact in the world, to like, to help someone in need, that there's, there are a few things that like get my blood pumping, like watching people come together to make a difference. I think a good example of this is in Exodus 36. And uh, in the time of Moses, the people were charged with the task of building the tabernacle, which is where God would dwell. And uh, so Moses sort of explains what's gonna happen and the community just responds beautifully. It's like this, it's like this old-fashioned barn raising. So all the, all the skilled laborers contribute in their different skills, and people bring an offering every single morning to help complete this task. In fact, so much so that Moses has to tell them to stop. Like, can you imagine the problem? Like, hey, I know you guys love giving. You're giving too much. Like, pump the brakes, calm down. And the, the community, they saw the vision of what God had for them. Moses cast the vision, and they all rallied around a specific 
cause. Community growers, you believe that the mission requires everyone to pull together to do their part. And that's really, in a lot of ways, how I feel about how God's wired us. That every single person in this room, regardless of who you are or where you came from, you've been uniquely wired and gifted to bring hope and healing to a hurting world, all of us. Whether you've memorized verses or not, whether you've been to church or not, regardless of what story you bring in here this morning, we're all wired to give back, to bring hope and healing to a hurting world. I think that is beautiful. Now, you often give financially because you know it's important, but you probably also maybe get frustrated when we talk about money here because you like to champion maybe the other parts of generosity, our time and our talent. But community growers, you're often one of the first to volunteer because you love seeing people come together for a specific purpose. And last, the legacy builders. Legacy builders. There's a, uh, a beautiful story of a legacy builder in the book of Ruth. It's a man named Boaz, and when he discovers that uh, like a, a distant relative of his, Ruth, uh, is actually in dire need, she lost her husband, and is gonna be destined to a life of poverty, uh, he steps up. He steps up in a really powerful way, and he puts his reputation on the line not only for her, but for her entire family. And if you trace her lineage, Ruth's lineage ends up pointing to a couple, maybe you've heard of them, called Mary and Joseph. And they had a baby, and they named him Jesus. Legacy builders, you're motivated by leaving a legacy. Like Boaz, he took a broader view of the impact of his life. You know somewhere deep down in your gut, like, man, I got about 80 to 90 here on planet Earth, and I want to do something. I want to leave a mark bigger than my own life. I want to send a ripple effect deep into it. I want to be a part of something that impacts people well after I'm gone. Legacy builders, you, you get this in a really beautifully profound way. Like, it's not ultimately just about me. It's about joining God in something way bigger bigger than me. Leaving a mark, leaving a legacy motivates you. You're often a visionary who looks beyond today, you look to your dreams for the future. You want your life to count for something after you're gone. It's probably really important to you to, to leave an inheritance. When a cause becomes important to you, you make investments both in the present and long-term planning. For you, the motivation is I want to leave a mark bigger than just myself. Now, we walked through all six profiles. I know that was a lot of content. Please hear me say this, that each profile is good. Each profile has its own unique strengths and opportunities. In fact, I think understanding how we're motivated can help us leverage our motivation to grow in these areas of generosity. After kind of analyzing some of the data, um, we found some pretty interesting research um, that we're gonna look at in the weeks ahead. And we found that um, there are three types of generosity. There's financial, serving, and relational. Financial is pretty clear, right? It's, it's how we actually interact with our, our wealth, our resources, and you know, often people will ask, why do we talk about these things? Jesus spends 25% of his earthly ministry talking about our wealth and possessions. He seems to think that there's, there's a real strong correspondence between how we view our stuff and what God's doing in our heart. The second is serving. It's how generous are we at contributing our time in and outside of the church. And then lastly is the relational piece. How are we, how are we giving of ourselves to people? Because we all know that you, you can write a check and even serve on a team but not actually give of yourself, you know what I mean? It's possible to do the first two and not the third. And so th these are the different types of generosity that in the next two weeks, we're gonna kind of dive a little further into. And each profile has tendencies. If you've ever taken a, a Myers-Briggs or a DISC or an Enneagram, you know that each of these profiles, they also kind of have like a shadow side, right? They have like opportunities, they have, they have hurdles. And so we're gonna unpack that, a different service. So you're gonna have to just come back, I'm sorry. You gotta come back if you wanna learn a little bit more about, okay, so what's some of the shadow side, some of the, the opportunities with my specific profile? But for now, let, let me encourage you this way. When we choose to be a people of generosity, we become conduits of the generosity of God. This God who decided to make a difference in your life and in my life, he knew that apart from his love, we were spiritually dead. Being wise beyond all wisdom, he had a plan for our spiritual growth to make us 
spiritually alive. He gave the most generous gift imaginable. He gave himself in the person of Jesus who in joyful obedience went to the cross, sacrificing himself so that you and I could experience being a part of a community, the family of God. Through us, he is leaving a legacy as we help more and more people find their way back to our generous God. Ultimately, friends, that's the point. We believe that God at his core is loving, kind, forgiving, and generous. And that when we're generous, we're reflecting the generous God who has been generous with us. Because that's ultimately grace. In a world that takes, God invites us to receive. In a world that is obsessed with throwing an elbow to get ahead, to climb the ladder, he says, man, I, I give myself freely so you can have peace with God and peace with others. That in Jesus Christ, you lack nothing. Jesus is the sum and substance of all of God's promises. And when our eyes are open to that, when we see all of life as a gift, every breath as a gift, we begin to like slowly loosen our white knuckled grip on our time, our talent, our resources. And it doesn't happen overnight. Right? Paul talks about sowing, right? You wouldn't plant a seed today and expect crop tomorrow. But over time, the more that we pray, God, open my eyes to the ways that I'm wired, the ways that I'm motivated. Help, help me to better see how generous you've been to me. I mean, that, that, that grip slowly begins to loosen up. You're like, man, I'm, we're just, we're stewards of all that God has given us, entrusted to us. What would it look like if we became a people that brought generosity wherever we went? Into our communities, into our families, into our places of employment, not because of how great we are, but because of how great our generous God is. And he invites us to join him in the work of helping people find their way back to him. Let's pray. God, thank you for being a God of radical generosity, way beyond what we could ever dream or imagine. We know that you have been good to us. And even in seasons, God, where we struggle, where we feel underwater. God, remind us of the ways that you've been present and moving in our life. Open our eyes, God, to better see the ways that you've been generous with us. Help us to see all of life as a gift. May we steward that gift well. Not for our own sake, not for our own glory, but to bring hope and healing to a hurting world, God. Give us new vision, new imagination for the ways that you've wired us, every single person in this room, to bring hope and healing to a hurting and broken world. God, we thank you, we love you, pray all these things in the beautiful name of Jesus, amen.